So the pleasure of uh, following Stevenson. What I'm going to talk about today is part of a sporadic and uh, protracted ongoing project on travellers after Stevenson in various parts of the world. I've already um, published um, on Travellers After Stevenson in the Cévennes in a volume edited by Richard Dury and on Travellers After Stevenson in the United States in a volume edited by Morag Monroe Landy. But today I sent, set out specifically to explore questions of identity present in the travel accounts of a number of writers who since the late 19th century have visited Scotland on the trail of Robert Louis Stevenson. And uh, those travellers include John Buchan, Clayton Hamilton, Nicholas Rankin, Gavin Bell, Hunter Davis, Michel Lebris and Ian Nimmo. These footsteps travellers are generally eager to experience the pleasure of visiting or revisiting the townscapes and landscapes familiar to Stevenson to see for themselves any traces left behind by the author in the homes and museums with which his name is associated. To get to know firsthand places familiar from his texts, gathering clues towards a proper understanding of the man and a judicious estimation of his work. That's a quote from um, Hamilton. Um, the initial motivation underlying these objectives is often quite explicitly to establish a unique and personal connection with what Henley called Stevenson's spirit, intense and rare, a re description that is reprised by at least one of the followers. The accounts of these travels in the footsteps of journeys often combine biographical, autobiographical and fictional experience. The narratives shuttle between present day reality, Stevenson's life story from childhood to adulthood and his fiction. Time is often further layered in such a way that the authors interact with their multiple past selves, those selves that read Stevenson as children, or those selves that may have followed in Stevenson's footsteps more than once, as is the case notably of Nimmo um, in the top right-hand corner there, who followed in Stevenson's footsteps on the kidnap trail, first as an 18-year-old and then as an older adult. The accounts reveal the shifting identities, national and otherwise, not only of Stevenson, but also of the writer following him, and also that of the people encountered on the journey and of the fictional characters that Stevenson created. This, and I quote, endemic obsessive reenactment of previous quests as Steve Clark points out, epitomises much of what we now consider to be postmodern travel writing. Similarly, the cultural sites and heritage trails that have been created to support these quests are, as Leavenworth remarks in her study of what she calls second journeys, all features of postmodern culture in which distinctions between separate fields and between the modernist binary opposites, such as the distinction between the past and the present, between uh, past reality and con contemporary experience, have to an extent collapsed. The accounts of these second journeys interact on many uh, levels with Stevenson's own texts, which are often woven into the travelogue with biographies of Stevenson and with the text left by each author's travelling predecessors, often through quite extensive quotations there again. The most obvious intertextual encounter is the collision between biography and autobiography, the, foli the foliation or interleaving, sometimes materially in alternating chapters of biographical and autobiographical observations of the present journey and a past journey or journeys and of fact and fiction. These Encounters also demonstrate an awareness on the part of the traveller follower of the ways in which the text, their texts, their texts and their journeys open up opportunities for an ongoing interaction between those different layers of experience, 
Stevenson's Scottish places having been thoroughly mapped in a number of senses, culturally, historically, and cartographically. And his followers frequently highlight their awareness of those who have preceded them on the trail and acknowledge the ways in which previous subjectivities have depicted the reality of the terrain, often simply in order, but often simply in order to claim their own originality uh, and their own approach in comparison to any forerunners. The official and unofficial heritage trails followed by the travellers in Stevenson's footsteps, in Edinburgh at least, include visits to the three houses in which he lived. Um, Eight Howard Place, um, n now part of Inverleith Row, and one, now nine, Inverleith Terrace, and of course, 17 Harriet Row. The, the status of the house on Harriet Row changes over time from a simple address at the beginning of the 20th century to a prime pilgrimage spot, to use Davis's expression, a locus invested with the footsteps travellers' theories about the character and history of Edinburgh. Rankin, who, like Davis, was entrusted with the keys to the house and invited to stay the night to get the real atmosphere, reads it, that's to say the house, as a statement in stone, symbolic of the spatial segregation of the classes, its ornamental balconies, astragals, high ceilings, fine staircase and protective gardens, part of an argument, a matter of class, culture and anglicisation that was rupturing the life of Scotland's capital. Gavin Bell, around about the same time as Rankin, was put off by the literal gate gatekeeping materialised in the brass plaque that eventually appeared on the I've said on the facade of 17 Harriet Row, I think it might be on the railings um, in front of, of the house, declaring, this is a private house, not a museum. <laughs> the urban fittings outside the house <clears throat> also were modified over time to reflect the interest in what was now the starting point of a heritage trail. And this in turn shaped future accounts of what was to become an officially sanctioned perhaps even sanctified, site of literary, literary pilgrimage, an archetypical lieu de mémoire. Eventually, even the importance of the lamp post for Stevenson lovers was endorsed by the addition of a plaque, the one on the right, confirming its literary and cultural significance. When there are no plaques in the other places associated with Stevenson in Edinburgh, the Followers sometimes anticipate their creation. In the late 1980s, Rankin lamenting that there is no statue, street or monument in the city to honour him, quotes from a letter from Stevenson to his friends Charles Baxter in which he evokes the dreary thoroughfare beside Rutherford's bar and jokingly but specifically proposes the creation of a, blast, a brass plate in situ. Rankin concludes, there is no brass plate, high or low, at the end of Drummond Street. But today, there is <laughs> a plaque on that, the very site that Stevenson identified. But alas, Rutherford's is no more. And so the stream of footsteps travellers systematically rings out all of the biographical matter from places associated <coughs> with Stevenson an itinerary which by the 1980s had been branded the Robert Louis Stevenson Heritage Trail. That's a picture from their website. Some of the followers, even as they visit all of the places on the Heritage Trail, are at pains to tell the readers that they do not count themselves among the tourists for whom it has been created. Rankin, again, while acknowledging that a sign on the railings of Queen Street Gardens announcing that this is the first step on the Robert Louis Stevenson Heritage Trail, is, while acknowledging that this is proof of perpetual interest in the author, says he has 
and I quote, a vision of blue rinsed ladies and querulous men in Stetsons following it. Like the Shakespeare country, it was a tourist package. So it seems that being part of a phenomenon, even as, as one is writing a book, capitalizing on that phenomenon takes much of the pleasure out of the enterprise. The expression of disappointment with the vestiges of Stevenson's life on display in what was to later be called the Writer's Museum became, becomes another common trope. After examining old photographs, riding boots and a fishing rod, Gavin Bell declares this was all dead stuff with no attempt to breathe life into them. For Rankin, it's not just the museum that is full of dead stuff, but the city itself. Edinburgh, he writes, is a city of the dead, with the freight of the, where the freight of the past lies heavy. The living seem oppressed by a sense of the deceased and their illustrious works. He notes, he notes, sorry, he notes, the colour grey, like the har and the rain, impregnates these accounts of Scotland's in general and of Edinburgh in particular. Hamilton, citing Stevenson himself, calls Edinburgh the grey metropolis of the winds, while Queen's Ferry is utterly grey in colour and Collington Manse is constructed staunchly of grey stone. For Gavin Bell, Stevenson emerged from the grey half-light of a Scottish winter. Rankin writes that in the rain, 17 Harriet Row takes on the hue of lead. And later, the reader is introduced to the slate grey town of Balahulish on the kidnap trail. Le Brice's description of his visit to Edinburgh is similarly steeped in misty greyness. He describes a mysterious, mythical Edinburgh, a maze of venals and dead ends permanently soaked in torrential rain, a city that corresponds not so much to any objective reality as to his French readership's idea of the ghost-infected, infested Scottish capital. He writes, C'est ici, ce soir, dans le vieil Edinburgh, battu par les vents qui soufflent de partout, détrompé par les pluies, enfoui sous le brouillard glacial venu de la mer, saupoudré de toute la neige qui arrive en trompe des Highlands, mm, a lovely thought, qu'il me semble enfin le retrouver, le retrouver, Stevenson, et quelques-uns de ses fantômes. The details of his account are correspondingly shrouded in blurriness. Places and people are consistently given erroneous names. And this disregard for accuracy in the transcrip transcription of the details of present reality is coupled with a correspondingly acute interest in the unnameable and indefinable atmosphere associated with the city and with Stevenson's past presence there just as the all-pervasive fog and greyness reflect the elusiveness of the footstep traveller's quest to recover something of Stevenson's spirit in Scotland. To track down the child Stevenson, many of these travellers venture out of Edinburgh to the village of Collington. Jefferson Singer, visiting Collington Manse in preparation for writing his psychological biography of Stevenson, perceives they are not a trace of his subject's past physical presence, but rather a reflection of Stevenson's split by boyhood identity. I'm going to start somewhere in the middle here. On, on the one side of the garden is the church, a symbol of convention and constraint, a bounded vision of omnipresent sin and repentance. Beyond the hedge and stone boundaries is the wild current of river leading to the city and beyond that to the sea and lands of foreign peoples and practices. To find the way through the hedge was to unlock the constricted geography of Calvinism, to step out of the shadow of the steeple church above and find freedom con from convention and debilitating shame. 
The descriptions of Collington Manse and its garden where Stevenson played as a young boy are similar in their reliance on Stevenson's own texts, which condition the follower travellers' reactions to the site and structure their accounts of it. Rankin also quotes extensively from A Child's Garden of Verses, like many of the other um, footstep travellers. He recounts his realisation that searching out tangible proof of Stevenson's past presence in the garden is futile, thus confirming Stevenson's own message in the poem to any reader. And I just see that I've got these in the wrong order. To any reader. The message being that past iterations of ourselves and others are irretrievable. For long ago, the truth to say, he has grown up and gone away, and it is but a child of air that lingers in the garden there. And this frustration inherent in the quest to recover something of Stevenson's boyhood is acknowledged by his followers, who nevertheless appear to derive some pleasure from repeatedly coming up against the impossibility, as if the difficulty of the enterprise somehow validated the worthwhileness of undertaking it. Frustration is evident when the followers co come up against a site that has been built over, when the map does not match the terrain and the keyword used in the situation is often overgrown. Hamilton, for example, claims that North Berwick, this was in 1918, North Berwick is now somewhat overgrown with seaside hotels but suggests that with some effort, the literary pilgrim may still identify landmarks familiar from the beginning of the lantern bearers, for example. Similarly, on the trail of kidnapped, Nimmo is dismayed to find that the spot where Colin Campbell was shot has been covered over by planting by the Forestry Commission. So the present inaccessibility of certain sites and landscapes familiar to Stevenson are generally experienced by the footsteps travellers as so many obstacles to be overcome in order to truly connect with the life of the author and the fictional lives of his characters, or semi-fictional in the, in the case of Kidnapped. John Buchan in an article based on a walking holiday in the Highlands in as early as 1898 on the kidnapped trail, short circuits any attempt to find the precise locations described in Kidnapped, claiming that Stevenson romanced with his landscapes, although they were always subtly correct in atmosphere. These travel accounts frequently feature performances of national identities as Scots or non-Scots or quasi-Scots, as well as observations on the performances of others. These notions of national identity, Stevenson's, the travellers, as well as that of the people met on the journey in Scotland, are almost always bound up with another common trope in this subgenre expressions of nostalgia and notions of an irretrievably lost Scottish heritage. So that Nimmo's account, for example, of Mull is framed in a lament for the disappearance of the island ways of the past. In the same way as Davis writes of Leith, you should see the area today with tarted up pubs, nicely painted old boats and twee shops. Edinburgh's old town has also been poshed up for the tourists. It, it is primarily Stevenson's Scottish, Scottishness that is being explored by the footsteps travellers, but following his traces in Scotland while combining autobiography and biography can make these writers more aware not only of the deep rootedness and importance, importance of that identity to the author that they are pursuing, as evidenced by their interactions with his later writing, especially at from Samoa. But the journey frequently also incites an examination and questioning of this follower's own Scottishness or non-Scottishness, 
or partial Scottishness. The Scottish footstep travellers make a point of claiming their national I that their national identity is an important point of convergence between their own lives and that of Stevenson, perhaps even an, an explanation for their identification with the writer. Others claim that their non-Scottishness is more complicated than it might seem. Rankin, Rankin's consciousness of his heredity is heightened aptly enough on this heritage trail. He considers him a child of the Scots diaspora whose face fits and his name as well, but who suffers from the, and I quote, yearning, yearning of the deracinated, another focal point of identification with the deracinated Stevenson yearning for Scotland from Samoa. Um, I'm going to skip over this bit and go straight to my conclusion. So, sorry about that. Sorry? Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> Um, so the conclusion, um, Kierstead argues that this subgenre of travel writing, rather than typifying the form's past or its postmodern exhaustion, can actually propel author and reader alike to a deeper awareness and critical understanding of the politics of travel, especially in post-colonial contexts. And we don't need to go as far as to characterise Scotland as a post-colonial context to see that there is a clear political subtext to these travel accounts and observe that those who follow in the footsteps of Stevenson in Scotland are often either willing to reassess their own national identities or experience an intensification of that identity and may come to question the, na the nature of the national identities of the people that currently inhabit the townscapes and landscapes associated with Stevenson. What they do not, however, question in their intersubjective polyphonic footsteps accounts is the reality of Stevenson's attachment to and identification with Scotland, nor indeed Scotland's current embracing of Stevenson in such a way that his past existence and his writing are mapped onto the land in memorials, plaques, place names and settled heritage trails and that the land can be apprehended through reference to his texts. Scotland shaped Stevenson, and he in turn has defined the cultural identity of parts of his native city and great tracts of his native country, chosen to be projected and sold to tourists, literary and otherwise, from within and out with Scotland for their travelling pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>